Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of V Brown Bag. Uh, I'm very excited this evening as we are doing a continuation of our Python for DevOps series, um, tech, talking with Python developers and learning how to level up our developer skills. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking with Chris Planky. Um, Chris is one of the contributors and members of the AWS Portsmouth um, user group, and uh, we were chatting the other week, and he graciously decided to come on and talk about uh, some of the stuff that he's doing in Python. Um, but first, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, getting on the conversation, uh, we are at vbrownbag.com on Twitter. For the live audience, you can contribute and ask questions via the Q&A panel. Um, obviously, we also have vbrownbag Latin America, vbrownbag EMEA. Uh, that's that's misspelled right there, so I should fix that. I'll fix that later. And if you um and if you do a hashtag V Brown bag, I will be paying attention and sending the questions to Chris. So um, again, our guest this evening is Chris Planky. He does not spend much time on social media. Good for him. Uh, however, you can find him on LinkedIn at Christopher Planky seven nine one four six one nine seven. I, as as always, am Chris Williams at Mistwire. You can you can make fun of me on on my Twitter hashtag. So without further ado, I will turn over to Chris. Mr. Planky, are you ready? I am. Thank you very much. I'm wishing I had a longer LinkedIn URL right now. I would have loved to hear you read that out. But well, uh, You know what? I can rip them out. I don't even care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, let me try sharing my screen here. So as Chris mentioned, uh, my name is Chris Planky. I am currently a software developer for Liberty Mutual. Uh, I am a huge AWS enthusiast. So that is where uh, I met Chris, as he mentioned. And I figured, hey, I will... Uh, Love to take a stab at talking Python and, and AWS with a couple of strangers on the internet. So yeah, here we are. All right. <laughs> um, today's topic, deploying to AWS using Python, Boto3, and CI, CD. Uh, so if any of you guys were here last week and watched Calvin's presentation on Boto3, um, you are going to be really enjoying this, hopefully. Uh, I took some of that code. We will be deploying that through some pipelines, but also talking about uh, what pipelines are and uh, how to use Python with them. So a quick overview. We will be discussing CIC what? So the D there uh, can stand for a couple of things, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> Some people will say uh, it stands for continuous delivery. Some will say continuous deployment. Some will say, what's the difference? Hopefully by the end of this, you will at least know how I interpret it. Um, I think you, know, you could ask 100 people and get 100 different answers. Um, but based on kind of what I know, how I feel, I will uh, explain that to you and you can either take it and believe it or challenge it. Um, and then the next topic there is Bodo 3. So let's jump right into it. So just real quick, uh, CI, CD, what does that really mean? So the whole goal here, the CI stands for continuous integration. Um, that's the concept of constantly making changes to your code, having it in a production ready branch and ready to be deployed. So um, I'm, I'm making the assumption here that, that most of you are familiar with Git and other source control management. Um, the concept of merging, you know, basically we have a handful of branches, we have a master branch or, or kind of gold copy of our application, the one that could run with no defects in it. Um, and so that's, you know, CI is all about getting code into that master branch, but it's important that you test it because you don't want to constantly put bad code into your master branch. Um, so continuous integration isn't just hitting the merge button and ignoring merge conflicts. It is having unit tests in your code. It's enforcing um, linting strategies and enforcing good code before it gets merged into your production ready code. And then once it is in your production ready um, branch, you know, most people that would be master, um, that's where this CD comes in and that's that continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So as you could kind of imagine by the name, uh, the goal here is to deploy frequently. And from my interpretation of the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment, uh, continuous delivery is just deploying frequently. Continuous deployment is when you have that automated. So it 
to me, the interpretation here is really, is it automated or is there a manual process? And depending on who you talk to, um, some people are going to say, hey, I do continuous deployment, but I do it manually because I don't trust systems enough to deploy code into production without um, an individual intervening and saying, hey, I, I am sure this code is good. So a good old case of people thinking they're smarter than computers uh, can sometimes be a problem there. But to me, the biggest difference here is um, continuous deployment is if that's fully automated, meaning no manual intervention between the time the code is built and the time the code is deployed. Um, some people will say that is great. Some people will say, I never want that to be the case in my organization or in my personal development life. So uh, I will leave that up to you. I don't want to fight anyone about it. Um, there, there, this is definitely a topic of controversy out there. Um, but I will include links to some resources where you can form your own opinions later on. So in regards to continuous integration and continuous delivery and deployment, there are a couple of tools that make this process easier. Um, some of the more common ones and the ones that I'm familiar with uh, for continuous integration, so those are going to be your source control management tools, something like GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Bitbucket, it's basically the same concept as GitHub, just made by uh, the company Atlassian. And Atlassian also makes popular tools like Jira and Trello and also Bamboo, uh, which is a continuous delivery and deployment tool. So some people find that the synergy between all of those products is really powerful and they choose to stay in that suite. Um, the pipelines that I will be demoing today will be using something called Bitbucket pipelines, which is um, a little bit lesser tier than Bamboo. Um, but we'll talk about those continuous delivery options when we get there. Um, you know, a great open source free solution for continuous delivery and continuous deployment is Jenkins. Um, so it's free, it has a bunch of plugins that other developers and organizations, you know, Amazon included, uh, release plugins to their plugin repository and you can add them along the way. If you are new to pipelines, but you need to own the infrastructure, um, or even if you wanted to have your pipelines out in the cloud, um, Jenkins is a really, really great solution uh, for people just getting started and for experts. Um, but the other kind of big competitor in the game is Bamboo. And again, that's made by Atlassian. Uh, the product from my general perspective is um, you know, kind of expensive. It's generally sold to enterprises. Um, I haven't looked significantly into their free tier because I've been using Bitbucket pipelines which I think is actually Bamboo's free tier. Um, and, and we'll talk about that as we get into it. But all of these here are links, so um, I'll make sure these slides are available. You can check them out. If you haven't heard of them already, um, you'll, you'll get some good info about Bitbucket today and uh, Bitbucket pipelines. So. little bit deeper dive into continuous integration. So I talked about some of these topics uh, earlier, but we want to dive into them a little bit more here. So with continuous integration, I talked about, hey, we have the concept of, you know, a master branch. This is our, our gold standard of code. This is something that we know is ready to go, ready to be run, is defect free. And that is the master branch. And when you start to think about, hey, how am I going to do continuous integration? Is continuous integration right for me or me and my team? Chris, are you still there? Hello, Chris? Hey, yeah, sorry, my this just cut out. Um, did you guys lose me? Yeah, yeah, you, you cut out about uh, 10 seconds ago. Oh, all right. So I'm um, not sure what just happened there, but um, talking about branching strategy here, we have our master branch and really, you know, when you're thinking about continuous integration, if it's right for you and your team, it's important to consider your branching strategy. And when you're considering your branching strategy, you want to think about things like, what is my team size? How frequently am I releasing changes? And the reason those factors are important is because if you have a large team and they're all working on different things, getting the code back to your master
Chris, you uh, you cut out again. Getting the code back to your master. Hello? Do you guys lose me again? Yes. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, wait. I'm, I'm not I'm sure right what's again. going on there. Getting, getting, getting. Back. <laughs> I'm. Hey. All right. So it sounds like I'm here. Okay. Um, yes. Really apologize about this. I'm not it's sure okay. what's going on. Um. So getting back to master, if you have a large team, they're all working on different things. That is going to be a little bit more complicated, and you might think about, you know, um, do I want a lot of branches? Do I want one branch, a feature branch that people work off of? They do a tiny, tiny change. They put it back in master and then go off of that. Or do we want to do kind of big changes? Um, or do we want to support both of those? So Atlassian, again, the maker of uh, that Bitbucket, they have uh, some phenomenal document documentation on their website. I have that link here. Um, I would highly suggest checking it out if this is a new concept to you. Um, but for anyone who's who's been working on software and in a team, you probably have some experience with um, branching strategies. The, the next important part of uh, continuous integration is enforcing code standards. So like I said, you don't want bad code being merged into master all the time. And so if you're asking your team to make a lot of small changes and get them back into master, you need to make sure that you have some process in place to ensure that that code is good code. And a couple of things that make that easier are linting. And if you're not familiar with linting, um, basically linting is a way to enforce um, certain characteristics in code, such as the maximum characters that can be on a line or how constants are defined. You know, do they need to follow a certain syntax? Um, how white space is, is defined. So do I need a blank line at the end of my file? Do I need um, documentation for each function? So most programming languages do support this linting concept. And um, there's a lot of plugins for different IDEs that you may choose to use that have um, linters enabled. Personally, I use VS Code and it you know, supports ES linting for our JavaScript projects and also PyLint, which I will be giving a demo of um, shortly. And there's also a link here to a good PyLint getting started tutorial, and it's actually what I used in um, the first demo that I will be giving. Um, so linting is great, and, and what's great about that is, you know, all of your developers basically can either have these linting profiles on their local machines, it could be part of the repository, and you can customize the rules 100%. So if you're a team who doesn't care if constants are in all capitalization, you know, you might ignore that rule and you can just basically create a flat file, an RC file um, that says, hey, these are the rules that me and my team agree about and we want to follow. Um, if you're just getting started with this, most of the languages, Python, Node, have default linters with default rules that are just kind of, um, I don't want to say industry best practice because everyone has different use cases. Um, but commonly accepted rules that typically require minimal tweaking. Um, Airbnb is a company that has some really good um, node linting profiles out there, and you could take a look at any of them, and, and the implementation might be a little bit different for all of the languages, but the concepts are the same as to what linting is trying to prevent. Um, a common, commonly controversial one is logging. Um, some linting strategies heavily enforced. There cannot be any logging. Um, some teams say, well, how am I going to troubleshoot my code if I don't have logging? So they choose to actively disable that. Um, and when we get to the demo, I'll show a little bit more of that. Hmm. Um, the other important one here is testing. So not only do we want pretty code, code that's formatted nicely and adheres to our standards, but we want to make sure that the code has been tested, that new changes didn't break old changes, and that the new functionality is trustworthy. So when I say enforce code standards here, these are a couple of things that you know you can look at in the code standards, but the way to enforce them is to have checks in your continuous integration pipelines that say, you can't do anything with this code if it doesn't pass our linting profile, if it doesn't pass our testing. 
And uh, just about any pipeline tool you use, um, and, even, and even repository, uh, is going to support this type of functionality. So when we get into the demo, um, you'll see how we can prevent people from merging code into master if they don't have a successful build. And we can fail builds if people don't have code that's linted nicely. And so that is actually going to bring us into our first demo. Um, all of this code is public uh, on my Bitbucket uh, link here. So uh, there's going to be two more repositories. I'll make sure that these links go out after this. Um, but you guys can check out, I think, bitbucket.com forward slash planky will probably get you there if you wanted to check it out now. Um, in the meantime, I will pull it up over here. All right, Chris, how does that look? Should I uh, zoom in on the code? No, no, it looks good. Looks good. Okay, cool. So over here, we have a Python code standards repository. And we can walk through the files in the repository. This one we really should ignore. Um, I'm actually going to. But if we look in here, um, so this is Visual Studio Code. This is my IDE of choice. Um, you see that I have a VS Code workspace folder. Um, this isn't anything that ever makes it into source control. It's in my uh, git ignore. Um, I have a file called bad.python. I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, I also have a file called good.python. <laughs> so we will take a look at the difference of these and why they are named such. I also have this YAML file, and this YAML file is actually my pipeline definition. So these are the steps that are going to be run in my pipeline. Um, but before we jump the gun, let's look into some of our, our linting stuff. Um, the only other things to point out in this repository, so if you guys watched last week's demo uh, with Calvin, he talked about pipm and all of the wonderful things that pipm has to offer. Mm. Um, so I decided to implement some pipm for this particular repo. You will see later on that I, I deliberately chose not to use pipm just to show you all the difference between um, the, the options that are out there. So. Very simple dependency file, right? All I want is pylint. Um, here it's indicated as a dev package and a regular package. I was playing around. Um, we really probably only need it as a dev package because the runtime code isn't using it. Um, I would highly encourage you guys, as, as you get a little bit more familiar with pipm and what the differences are between dev dependencies and, and non-dev dependencies, um, be familiar with that and and make sure that you're not putting um, dev dependencies in the code that's going to get deployed. And just at a high level, what makes something a dev package versus a regular package? A dev package is, you know, what are the dependencies required to test the code, to build the code, but not required for the code to run correctly? So in this case, you know, when we're talking about enforcing code standards, we want to make sure that the code looks pretty and follows our standards. But PyLint itself isn't what this Python function uses. It's not what this Python function needs. Um, this Python function actually needs a string. And so that actually should be in my pip file. I'm not sure why things work without it, um, unless, you know, of course, it, it, it's just a default uh, Python package. But it's important to, to say, hey, don't get my dev dependencies mixed up with my runtime dependencies because that's going to make your runtime files significantly larger than they need to be and um, just not as performant as they could be. So we got this repo here. Um, we're going to do a quick demo of what PyLint actually is. So if I open up this um, Python file here, uh, I, I literally just grab this off the internet. You can see there's a link in the good.py. Um, I don't particularly care what this code does for this demo. It does look like it's a little encode decode function. Um, what I care about is that it has some poor syntax and I don't like that as, as a developer and as someone who might have to work on someone else's code. I want to enforce that the code looks pretty. So uh, we're gonna do that with PyLint. 
and uh, that, there was a link out to it in the last slide. I would suggest you guys look into it if you get the chance. Um, but right now, we are going to go ahead. Is is that an extension that you're running in VS Code, Pylint? Um, so so it's not. So uh, the extension part is, and we'll see. I'm I don't know that I even have it enabled right now. So when you when you do it in your um, IDE, uh, you'll start to see things like, and, and it doesn't look like it is working right now, but anything that isn't formatted nicely, it'll give you like a little warning over here, right? Like you would see if, if you've used Eclipse, you know, you're used to those yellow exclamation points or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so those plugins are going to make your IDE look pretty, um, but those aren't going to be installed as a dev dependency or a runtime dependency because that's really just looking at your code. It's not part of your code. So this isn't particularly focused on the, the IDE plugins, but rather running the package against your code and seeing how your code performs. I see, okay. So, and, and the reason that, that you would wanna do that is because you know your pipelines don't have an IDE. Um, they have to pull the package from pip to be able to use it. So I end up living a lot of my development life as if I were a pipeline. Um, you know, hey, what dependencies do I have? What what does my environment look like? Um, and, and for that reason, I'm not wicked heavy on my IDE plugins, but uh, they, they definitely do add value. And if you're just getting used or introduced into PyLinting, um, I, I would highly suggest getting the plugins for your IDE. Hmm. So in my readme here, I did include um, the instructions on how to run these files, mostly so I didn't forget them for this demo, um, but also to help you, the viewer. And I'm gonna grab it. Um, to, to, let's make sure. So I'm going to enter the right repo. And I'm gonna run the bad Python file. And we're just gonna take a look at the output as a group and kind of talk about what we see. And you can actually see even in these ones, um, I had some flags set and I'm actually just gonna disable that one flag. but. What I'm doing here is in my pipm, my virtual environment, I am going to run pylint on the bad.py Python file. And I guess, wait, it looks like, oh, it's waiting for input. Um, that quote? Oh, that there, yeah, that's not the quote, good call. Not sure where that came from. So we are going to get yelled at, I think, uh, pip env within a virtual environment, so it'll automatically use that environment. So in my pip file, I do say, hey, this requires uh, Python version 3.5. Oh, we didn't get yelled at. I shouldn't have said that, then. Um, my <laughs> local machine is using 3.6. Sometimes pip env will uh, yell at you if there's a mismatch, but as long as it's, you have a newer version on your local, it typically runs. Um, when we get to the pipeline, I'll talk about why I use 3.5. But that's not the point right now. Here we want to take a look at the output of linting. So once we started linting, we can see here, hey, on this line, there's bad white space. So taking a look at this, I would assume, hey, this probably wants a space between encoded equal sign space encoded. Um, if we look, hey, we see another one of those. We also see trailing white space, missing new line, no space allowed before bracket. So I'm sure if any of you guys are like me, you might be rolling your eyes right now. Like who, who cares about spacing? Um, the other developers who have to touch your code care about spacing. So, so be friendly to them. Um, here we have missing module doc string. And then some of my least favorite ones, these constant names don't conform to the uppercase naming style. And this one here, else clause on loop without a break statement, also known as a useless else on loop. Um, bunch of rules here. So what we could do is, um, oh, actually this is also important here. So you do see that uh, 
this particular linter does give you a code rating. Uh, here we got a code rating of 3.16 out of 10. <laughs> we wanted to boost that rating. Uh, yeah, I, full disclosure, I got this code off the internet. I didn't write this myself. I only write code with 10s. That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish. I wish it was that easy. Um, so there you see I just added uh, a couple of white spaces around those encoded. Um, let's save this and run it again and, and see what we're working with. All right, so 4.21. So we went up a little bit. Um, we could keep going through all of these individually. I think that's kind of uh, a boring task, a waste of everyone's time. So what we will do is we'll take a look at good.py. And here I did go through and, and make most of these fixes but I am going to run um, this same here uh, against good.py. It is worth noting this reports now. I'll actually set it to yes right now. Um, this flag here will give you some more useful com uh, content in the output. Um, so tables, everyone loves tables. Uh, so that's what you can get um, if you set that flag to true. I typically just want to read things quickly and, and typically don't use that flag. Um, but if we look here, we still aren't using the uppercase syntax for our constants, and we still have this else clause, um, useless else on loop. But we do see here, hey, our code has a 6.84, right? That's almost double the last one. We, or I guess, you know, that's double our first run. Um, still not perfect. But let's say the team I'm on doesn't agree that constant should be uppercase. And either we don't know how or we don't want to fix this useless else loop. We feel that this else loop is useful. We as developers do still have some power over these linting tools. And we have the ability to use additional flags to ignore some warnings. So if we take a look at this command here, we can see, hey, here's a disable flag. I am disabling useless else loop. Oh, OK, we remember seeing that one. So I, it's fair to assume this isn't going to throw an error now if it sees that. Also, I, I want to define what my constants should look like. And so they should match this uh, regex pattern. Um, I don't care what the default linter says. I don't care if it says they should be all uppercase. So as developers, you know, you and your team or, or, or you know, an architecture team above you may decide these things for you, um, but there are certain uh, commands different teams will want to enable or disable. So we're going to run this one now, and we're hoping for a 10, right? If you can't fix it, ignore it. <laughs> uh, so this also does give you the previous run right there. Um, hey, last time you ran this, 6.84, you've gone up 3.16. So great, good stuff. Um, but that's all locally. That's that's one person that's putting a lot of trust on someone to say, hey, don't commit this code unless it's perfect, and I'm just going to trust you, right? Nobody trusts anyone anymore. Uh, so so we have pipelines and, and automation to enforce some of these rules, and that is where our pipeline tools come in. And um, I will open that up now. So over here, uh, this is Bamboo, again, made by Atlassian. If you've used any Atlassian products, this probably looks pretty familiar. Um, we're going to jump into this Python code standards. And this right here looks just like Git for anyone familiar with that, right? So we have our master branch. We have our feature 1.0 branch. Um, they both look pretty much the same. Good stuff. Uh, we can take a look at past commits. So uh, when we look at this page, uh-oh, this warning could severely impact this demo. Um, but uh, <laughs> when we look at this page, we see, hey, there's the master branch. Uh, that had a successful build. That's awesome. Um, and then there's the feature branch, and it has a failed build. And we'll talk about that a little bit and, and why we set it up that way. So. The one that the feature branch here, if we take a look, 
We're going to take a look at our Bitbucket Pipelines YAML file. And for those of you who aren't familiar with YAML, it stands for yet another markup language. Uh, that's my, my favorite thing about it. Um, and <laughs> right here, this uh, kind of aligns really well with infrastructure as code. Um, basically, you're defining every time someone commits this code, um, and you can actually set that, but the way this most pipelines are set up is every time there is a commit, uh, you need to execute a certain amount of steps. And some people have, um, you know, separate deploy pipelines from their build pipelines. Some people have build and deploy pipelines. Some people only have build pipelines and still manually do deploys. I feel bad for those people, um, but, but it does exist. So these pipelines are pretty flexible and you can set them up to either build for you or deploy. In this case here, um, we are only demoing a build and you can actually see that it, the last one failed. But right here, the build, all it does, pip install, pip env. So that's the same thing you would have had to do if you were running locally. Um, pip env install, so that's gonna look at your pip file and it's gonna say, hey, what dependent Hello? Hello, hello? Hey. Hello? All right, yeah, that keeps dropping on me. Um, but that was a good run. We Hey, we made it like 15 minutes last time. So <laughs> we'll, we'll take it for what it's worth. Um, so pipenv install, you would have had to run that locally. Um, and then here you see this pipenv run uh, pylint bad.py. And that's the same command that I was running down here. That's where we were seeing that two stars. Uh, I'm sorry, not two stars, two points. And that's all this pipeline does. So let's run it and kind of take a look at, at what that means. I'm actually not sure the best way to run it without a commit. So we will do a commit. Um, we're just gonna do a non-breaking change here. We're gonna add another comment line. file is not a good oh whoops syntax is there a difference between doing it um, manually from the terminal like that and then or, or, or just committing from within vs code uh preference 100 percent preference um so yeah you're talking about the difference you know using this over here right yeah um which it didn't even see that as a change which i'm not sure oh save it I am. Uh, I guess the answer is because one works and one doesn't. Um, no, sure. typically I I would. I think it's because I have multiple projects open up right now. Um, okay. This isn't working. I, I just I just wasn't sure if there was a um a, a difference or a, a reason for no. doing it one way or the other. Um, no. So I you can do it both ways. Um, one thing I don't know that I, I really talked about is if you wanted to run your linting. Um, before you got to a pipeline, you could run something called a, a pre-commit. Mm -hmm. And basically every time someone runs a git commit, this, it, it runs a suite of either tests or validations and says this has to pass before the user can commit their code. Um, but unfortunately, you know, developers can still use the force flag and can get around that. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say it's best to have it in your pipeline it doesn't hurt to have it at your developer level and in your pipeline. Um, so, so duplicating it, um, but, but really trust no one. Um, put it into the pipeline if you can is, is kind of my thought. Gotcha. There was a, one additional question. Um, oh, never mind. Uh, that, that actually answered Graham's question. Cool. Um, it doesn't look like it is taking that. I'm not sure what's going on here. I think something is wrong with this configuration. So we are actually just going to um, edit right in Bitbucket, which is um, an option. So again, this is this right here, a prime example of why a, a pre-commit isn't going to work, right? If you have a developer that goes in there and just edits the code in the repository, right. uh, there's no there, there's no pre-commit to run. The code's the code's there, so that's no good. Um, so let me do. 
commit. And once I do a commit, um, we will be able to go to our pipelines. And we will see that my drive didn't kick off like it was supposed to. Maybe that's part of the issue that they're experiencing. Yeah. Um, yeah, because you just, those all those just went away. They were. Okay. Well, <laughs> while that tries to figure itself out, we <laughs> will take a look at what I was hoping to show you. Um, and so this here is going to the continuous integration point of you don't want to merge bad code into master. So most um, repository, uh, whether it's GitHub, whether it's Bitbucket, um, you, you will have some sort of ability to manipulate pull requests and say who is allowed to submit pull requests, who's allowed to merge, and what code is allowed to be merged. And so if we take a look here, one of these options, this one. Um, this is a rule that I had built, and we'll take a look at it. But basically, my rule here is saying, if anyone wants to do anything with master, everyone's allowed to do it. But I'm going to run a merge check. And I'm not going to let anyone merge if there was, uh, if there was not one successful build. And so what that means is, you know, if someone commits code and it's bad code and has a failed build like we saw there we go like we saw over here then they should never be able to merge that code into master and um let's see if we can just oh cool we can actually rerun this one so i will do that um, so this is our bad code here, right? If you remember, this is the one that got like a two point or a three point something on <laughs> the piloting. We can see here that this is running the commands that were in our um, YAML file. So if we were to open that up in the background, um, you know, pip install pip env, we can take a look at the output there. Uh, we can take a look at the pip env install, and then the next one is pip env run pylint bad dot pi. And it is important to note the times here because especially on um, the Bitbucket pipelines, they do the free plan is only for the first 50 minutes of builds a month. Um, so you definitely, if you're using the free plan, are going to be aware of that. Um, if you know you're on an enterprise plan or, or something different, um, typically you don't care about those things. But if you want to use the free tier, your build times are kind of important. So it is nice to see that. But what we care about here is this bad.py um, and, and the failure, right, the big red. So what happened is we see the same output we saw before. And because our code didn't get a 10, it basically thinks that it errored. It didn't return a zero. It had a, a non-zero exit code was kind of the error behind the scenes. And that's actually something set up in Pilot by default. Um, it has to be a 10. Different linters give you the ability to set different thresholds. So you could say, hey, I only want my code to, to build if it's a, a six or above, um, because I understand that some of these rules are ridiculous. Um, <laughs> in, in our case, I didn't configure that. Uh, I went with the, the 10 or nothing model. And so what I wanted to show you guys here was, OK, we had a build that failed. Um, I, as a developer, I want to open a pull request. And I want to merge this bad code, feature 1.0, into master. And I think it's the next screen that's actually going to show. If this works, it's going to be a pretty bad demo. Um, all right, so it does say, all right, it's this button. There we go. So because I am the admin of this repo, I, at the end of the day, it could press this merge button. But if anyone else were on here um, and not an admin, mm. this is going to be disabled because of this warning right here. So we see that there was not a successful build on the last commit. 
so we're not able to merge it into master. Um, you, you guys got to trust me on the admin access here. I promise anyone else, uh, you know, that warning would be enough to prevent them from, from committing. And so that is what I meant by enforcing code standards. Don't let people put code in master if that code does not belong in master. So I will open it up if there's any questions about kind of what that means. Uh, a couple of trust no one comments. Uh, and somebody said, we believe you. <laughs> awesome. I, I love it. So that, that they completely contradict each other, right? Trust right. no one and then we, we believe you. So Well, it was yeah. two different people. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so that's it, right? Two types of people. Um, so that was that for that demo. Uh, we will hop back over to the PowerPoint and we're going to talk a little bit more about continuous delivery. So continuous delivery here, and, and notice I'm using delivery and not deployment. That's because um, we're talking about delivering the code here that not fully automated. You can have automation, automation to have continuous deployments. Um, but we're going to talk about continuous delivery, and then we're going to demo continuous deployment. So what is continuous delivery? It's really, you know, once the code's in master, what are we going to do with it? Where are we going to go with it? And some of the things you can do with it um, are deployed to multiple environments. So if you have a development environment and a production environment, you can use pipelines to differentiate between the two. If you um, have, you know, in AWS and you want to do US East 1 and US East 2, same concept, you have the ability to do that. Uh, if you want to do blue-green deploys, so, you know, have two versions of your app out there at the same time, um, that's not usually something that, that your pipeline tool is going to give you, but uh, it's a reason for continuous delivery. So, hey, I merged some code into master, but I only want, I don't want 100% of my users to start interacting with it. I want to do some beta testing. So you would use, you know, maybe continuous deployment for every new feature uh, deploy to this environment that only 10% of my traffic goes to. And that's something companies like Amazon and Facebook do routinely. Um, and, and that concept is blue green deploy. And, and it's also good if you want to just slowly transition people from one server to the next. Um, great use case for, for continuous delivery um, to get your code to those environments. Continuous delivery does not have to deploy to the cloud. Um, I am a huge cloud enthusiast. So that's what this demo is about. But you absolutely can deploy. You can use these pipelines to deploy to Windows servers, Linux servers. Uh, virtual machines, anything. Um, these things are pretty versatile. They really just execute code in a certain manner um, and very powerful. Um, they, they really utilize infrastructure as code. Um, and then that's typically how you get these resources out there. So for AWS, there's a bunch of different ways to implement infrastructure as code. Um, but what infrastructure as code is, is it's, it's really definitions of your servers, your applications, your um, IAM policies, it's it's all committed and checked into a source control. So if there's for version history and that what's in your development environment, you can say with absolute certainty is the same code that is going to your master environment with no manipulation, no human manipulation in between um, to possibly introduce errors or, or anything like that. So um, AWS supports that with CFTs, Boto3, the AWS CLI, SAM, which is the serverless application model. Um, Terraform and Ansible are, are other ways of getting your code to multiple environments using infrastructure as code. Um, Azure and Google Cloud both support those as well. Um, Azure's response to CFTs are templates, and I couldn't find what Google called theirs, um, but they did say that they supported Terraform and Ansible. So. Um, and then, as mentioned before, you just got to automate to have continuous deployments. And the demos that we are going to jump into after this slide that I forgot was here um, are going to use continuous deployment, no manual intervention to get code out. So uh, we're going to do this with Boto3. Uh, we're not going to be using CFTs, cloud formation templates. Um, Calvin made a very good case for Boto3 last week. Um, I don't know that I'm switching from CFTs anytime soon. 
Um, but we, we are going to go through Boto 3. And what that is, is that's the AWS SDK for Python. So it, it's your way of interacting with AWS using Python code um, rather than, you know, the CLI, which, which you would do. Um, you can do, you know, they have PowerShell libraries and things like that. Um, or, you know, if you were using Node or something, you would literally use the AWS SDK. Um, but the one for Python is called Boto 3. The biggest gotcha here is that to interact with the cloud is that you have to have an access key and a secret key. And those are something that you have to manage. Those are secrets. Uh, Calvin last week was, I think, using last password as a way to manage those. Um, some people, you know, don't do that. Some people um, store their credentials locally which is great for, for local development. But once you start to think about, hey, I have to have a pipeline, pretend to be me and deploy this code, how do I keep those secrets safe? I don't want to commit those into source control. Um, what do I do? So we'll, we'll talk about a couple of the options there as we get into it. But uh, for anyone who wants to learn more about Boto3, um, Calvin Hendricks Parker last week on V Brown Bad. Phenomenal presentation. <laughs> YouTube.com, right there. Check it out. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to read the whole URL. I'll, I'll save that for Chris. But uh, uh, there's also some documentation here for Boto 3. It'll be right above you in the playlist. Oh, great. So I would suggest watching his first if, if you're going <laughs> to. If you're watching this later, you're seeing this now, pause it. Go watch Calvin's. Come back. I'll come see back. you in an hour and a half. Perfect. All right. uh, <laughs> cool. So for the next part here, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to go through two more demos. Uh, we are going to deploy a Python Lambda function using pip, notice not pipm, and bamboo pipelines. And then for those of you who were participating last week or have watched the video since, um, I took Calvin's serverless Aurora cluster, his pipm structure right off his repo, and um, I am also deploying that to the cloud using um, bamboo pipelines. So let us jump over there. Um, I am just going to try quitting Visual Studio Code and opening it again to see if that fixes the Git thing. Um, just a second. Sweet, it never comes up on the right monitor. How about that? <laughs> um, all right, so we're back. I don't know if that looks any better, but we don't want to look here. We're going to jump into Boto3 Lambda. So, oh, all right, so the problem is that I have too many good things going on in my documents folder. Um, and so that's 5,000 plus. So that was the issue we had last time. Um, good to know. Um, all right, so looking at this Boto3 Lambda, what we have going on here, we have this requirements folder, which is a little bit different. We haven't seen that before. Um, I'm actually going to delete it, but uh, that is where our requirements or our dev dependencies, as, as you, you, know, you saw on a pip file, um, that's where they're going to get deployed. And instead of using a pip file, um, Python you know, allows you to install from really any file. Um, we're going to do it from the requirements.txt file. Um, we have our pipeline YAML here. So you can see there's a little bit more going on here. Our pipeline is, is doing a lot more. Um, it's running an apt get update. We're installing uh, the um, zip package so that we can zip up our code. We're installing Boto3. Uh, we're also installing all of the files from our requirements uh, Lambda. So again, these are our runtime uh, requirements, not our development requirements. Um, there's a pretty big case for why requirements.txt is an awful solution uh, once you get used to pip -m, um, because you do have to kind of, it's a little bit harder to manage that dev dependency versus runtime dependency. Um, but um, I, I just wanted to show you guys there are other options. I wouldn't recommend this one, but if, if you want to do it, you can. Um, so this is the requirements right here. This is saying, hey, I want you to install everything from the requirements.txt into a target directory, and that's our requirements directory. I then want to enter that directory. I want to zip it up. I want to leave that directory. 
I want to do some more zipping at a higher level, and then I want to run a Lambda function. So what's different here is this is actually doing a deploy. It's not just doing a build. And we will take a look. Um, this is the Lambda function that we're going to deploy. Uh, seven lines of code, very simple. All it does is hit this world clock API and it gets the, the now timestamp for Eastern time zone. Um, wanted to keep it simple. The, the Python here wasn't what, uh, I'm sorry, the Lambda here wasn't what the focus was. It's really um, the ability to deploy code and, and you could put whatever you wanted in your Lambda function if you wanted to. Um, this is just a little boilerplate to get you started. Um, if we take a look at our requirements file, we see that we do require uh, requests. And um, that's it. And then if we take a look at this Lambda deploy file, this is kind of a little bit more than, than you know, the Lambda itself. Um, this is why I, I'm inclined to use CFTs because you don't have to write the logic to deploy the code. You just have to say, this is what I want deployed. Um, so here, you know, you can see it's, it's about 103 lines to get the code deployed. Um, this deploy script is capable of updating and deploying net new lambdas, and then I'll show that. Um, and I did hack it together with love uh, using a couple other resources there. So you can see those, and this was a license associated with one of them. But we'll walk through what this does and, and some of the important things here. Um, so I had, I had used environment variables, and these are important if you guys are deploying code to multiple environments. Um, you're you're going to want to be able to specify, hey, in different environments, we need to have different things going on. Um, I chose to um, make our Lambda function name an environment variable, as well as the role, the IAM role, that our Lambda will use. And for those of you not super familiar with AWS. Um, basically, every resource in AWS has um, access management restrictions, and those are controlled through um, IAM, Identity Access Management, roles. And so this is just the, the role that I want my Lambda to use when I deploy it. So we jump into this a little bit more. Um, this code here, this is just generic. So it publishes a new version of the AWS Lambda function. If this fails because a Lambda with this name does not exist, it will create a Lambda with that name. So kind of a hacked solution. I, I'm not sure that this would be the, the right way to do it for production. You would probably want a um, new Python deploy file and a Python update file. Um, I wanted to just kind of combine everything into one. Um, here we decline our, uh, define our Boto3 session. Um, I chose to use this session to allow people uh, if you had to set your AWS region or if you had to use a different AWS credential set, um, you could do that. I didn't need to do that, but it is very common for people to. So I did include that line commented out. Here you can see, uh, you know, we're going to register a client uh, for Lambda in region US East 1. Um, if there's an error, let us know. Um, and then try to update a Lambda. And here we can see this is referring to our environment variable. Um, here it's saying use the zip file. Um, as you guys know, this obviously isn't a zip file. So that zip file doesn't exist until we run those uh, commands in our pipeline. Um, but by the time we call this file, we're making the assumption that we have the zip file. Uh, and then we catch any errors. And this is where we kind of hack it together here. So. If the error is because the resource isn't found, that means that, hey, there's nothing to update. We need to deploy a completely new one. So again, if that's the case, you know, Lambda does not exist, we must create it. Um, we're going to open our zipped file. And here we set some, some information about our Lambda. So the function name, again, you see this role ARN. Um, that was defined up above, and, and we'll be injecting it as an environment variable. And then you have the Python runtime, the code, which is, is your zipped file, um, a description, timeout, memory size, and if you want to publish it. Here are some more parameters I'm not setting, um, but you can if you want to, so I left them in there. And then just some simple uh, printing and other fun stuff. So 
we could run this locally, but I think for the, the sake of time, um, it, it's going to be more exciting to run from Bamboo. Um, assuming that it works, right? So let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Um, Boto 3 Lambda. So here I do only have this one branch. Um, and if we were to take a look at, um, you know, you're, you're only going to see information about that. We do have the same pipeline concept. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, this free tier only has 50 free minutes a month. So you want to make sure your pipelines are as optimal as possible. Here you can see I added some caches. Uh, I actually don't, oh, it did work. Um, so you can see that there's now a cache there. And if we take a look at this right here, so with Bamboo and this YAML syntax, uh, this actually has nothing to do with YAML, just this with Bamboo pipelines, um, you can set caches and say, hey, every time I run a, a pip command in this case, cache whatever you download to make the next, um, the next run faster. Hmm. So um, I'm going to rerun this one and we'll see. So as you can see here, these are all of the steps that um, they, they match exactly what our pipeline uh, YAML file looks like. Um, I'm going to run it for you guys and at the same time um, open up AWS, right? Because trust no one. So, um, Oh, and we didn't talk about one thing. So environment variables. Um, you guys had saw that I had had said, hey, grab these values from the OS environment. But I didn't set them anywhere. So I have to show you guys where I did that. Um, I will also say that in the readme for this one, um, just kidding, in the cheat sheet for this one, um, you do have the ability to when you're running your code to set the environment variables. Um, so here you can see I'm setting my environment variables and then I run Python Lambda deploy. So that's how you do it locally. Um, I'll show you how we did it in Bamboo as well. So, uh, uh, Oh no. Okay, so my API keys are um, bad. So I will have to fix those on the fly and, and hope that you guys don't see them. But uh, we'll talk about that right now. So back in our pipeline settings, um, we have the ability to set variables. And so here you can see, hey, this is the function name and this is the role ARN that, that you had seen before. So Hmm. Bamboo is smart enough to know that, hey, if you have repository variables, they need to be injected as OS variables during runtime. Um, it also looks for this access key and secret key to be able to deploy. So what I'm going to do right now on um, another monitor is uh, get those access keys and be sure to disable them immediately after in case I do accidentally share them. Hmm. Trust no one, especially not Graham. Yeah, I heard you You uh, told people to be wary of him in the last one, too. So <laughs> He's getting a reputation. <laughs> yeah, yeah he's, he's a scary guy on the call, huh? Uh, the, yeah. Um, just a second over here. So I'm actually just going to see if I can... Um, I'm not really sure how those access keys expired because I had run this uh, earlier. But what I just tried doing was hoping that the keys didn't expire and then I was just playing around with the permissions and broke that. So I just um, bumped up the permissions and we are going to try and run it. So here we can see, um, you know, that step, the 
set to download these things took very short period of time and I actually I'm a bit confused by that output so okay so it, it actually just downloaded the cache of pip right there so um when it does the real pip install it should take less time than previously uh well then i guess the first time I but sweet that's what it will oh uh, dang it spoke too soon all right um an error occurred when calling the exception. So create function operation, deploy user is not authorized to, I know that's not true. Um, so it's, that is definitely unfortunate. What we'll do is um, just take a look at the other one and that is using different credentials and that one might deploy. Okay. Um, I don't want to keep you guys too, too late here. Um, so the last one here, this is Calvin's um, serverless cluster. Um, this is literally just his, the code he used. I did have to make some changes. Um, I had dropped this down to only produce two serverless instead of 10, and that's because I had to manually delete them because I didn't use his Bodo client to delete. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I made it smaller. Um, uh, I'll bump it back up before the deploy. I also did have to, and he mentioned this in his, you're, you're gonna have to plug in your VPC security groups and your subnets. Right. Um, but again, this is just, we're initiating Bodo 3. Uh, in this case, we're using relational database service instead of Lambda. And we're gonna deploy um, a bunch of servers and we're gonna download their credentials to a CSV file. And what's cool about this is we still have the ability to use that CSV file from a pipeline and, and use the output of a build. Um, this one is again using pip file. Um, and the only thing really different here is that we do have to define the artifacts um, so that this is what gives us the ability to access that database later. Um, no, I'm sorry, not that, well, yes. So this gives us the ability to download the CSV later and the contents of the CSV let us access the database. Mm. So. Um, again, this is Calvin's code with just a couple substitutions and um, and bamboo, I guess, is the only difference there. So hopefully this one works. Um, so if we were to look at this one, too, we will also see that I have a handful of environment variables again access key secret key region um the cool thing about this is you know i can add whatever i want and i can have it be plain text or not um oops, man it'd be great if i could get this leaky um and then if uh, i guess that doesn't work um and then if i didn't want you guys to be able to kind of see that value later on um so this is this is good to a degree, there's still some manual intervention there for the first time you do this. Um, some people have these keys uh, dynamically created and uh, injected at runtime. So there's definitely very secure ways to do this. Um, this is an easy one. And for small projects and, and small companies, you know, this would definitely be a good approach. Um, if you are a large enterprise, you, you're probably going to want to look for a different solution. Um, but enough talk. Let's kick this one off, hopefully. So you can see this one uh, took a lot more for me to figure out how to get things to, to work correctly. Artifacts question mark, wasn't sure about that. Um, <laughs> but we are going to run this. The beauty of it is we can uh, talk about old builds if we have to. Uh, no, wow, that's running. So if we um, take a look, right now you don't see another tab up here. If this goes as expected, you'll see a new artifact tab up here. Um, we'll talk about that. That's for the uh, the output of the CSV file? 
Yes, that is where it will go. And and actually, the, the unfortunate part about this and, and something that I didn't spend a lot of time researching was it appeared that because my repository is public, so are my artifacts. And mm. in which case, all my DB passwords are going to be uh, right. shared with you guys. So cool. Uh, this one actually worked. Very exciting. So that means that I just have to update my access keys on the other one. Um, but what we are going to do now is pop over to AWS. And you can see, so this is, I had a DB123. Um, if I hit refresh, you can see that uh, we have this SASS00 deploying right now. Um, and that actually came from, um, we'll take a look at the code. Um, that came from create serverless clusters. Um, so here we do count SAAS uh, zero, well, it's less than two, um, which only gives us one. But um, so we can see that that one got deployed. When Calvin gave his demo, he did 10. I'll actually do that just for fun right now. Um, and I am going to delete this one so that we don't get a conflict. Oh, you created a final snapshot. Yeah. Can't do anything about that now, huh? Yeah, no, it's going to do its okay. thing. Well, that was pretty quick. So uh, we just bumped that up to 10. I'm going to hit commit. Um, and while that runs, we'll take a look at the output of the last one. So back to our pipelines, master. Um, oops. So see, this is how things were supposed to work, right? Uh, you guys just saw me edit that file, and now it's running a build, and, and everything is happy. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't manually kick off a build. Um, that was automatic. That's how pipelines are supposed to work. That is that continuous delivery model and continuous deployment. You know, that's the automation right there. So I swear I had it wired up. You guys saw the bucket. I was having some issues. I'm blaming them. It's never my fault. Um, I blame Graham. <laughs> So when we click on this artifacts tab, um, we see, hey, new db, dbs.csv. Let's go ahead and download that, which is a zipped file, which I didn't know. Let's see where that opens up. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, just a second. It opened up on my other monitor, and I have a bunch of downloads that I now need to go through, uh, what is that called? New DB, new DB. All right, um, so this is the one, uh, it definitely has a broken timestamp there. Uh, we traveled back in time to get this, um, but we open it up. Boom. Um, we can see that this here, uh, this is the username, this is the password. Graham's already into it, I bet. Uh, you know, <laughs> filling that up with data. So um, I'm, I'm making fun. I, you know, I'm, I don't even know you, Graham. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> let's go. If we take a look over here, so I actually I broke. Uh, Calvin's code, what was supposed to deploy 10 serverless uh, instances, deployed a serverless instance with 10 zeros. Uh, significantly less exciting. But, um, you know, that was deployed with the pipeline. These are some of those attributes that I had set in that uh, deployment script. Um, and I um, think that is it. If if anyone has any questions, I, I'd be happy to answer them. No, um, I know we can excellent. No, uh, around there. Oh no, no, it was it was it was great. Um, uh, there was there was a lot of comments about fantastic job. This is really good stuff. Uh, very very appreciative. Um, no, I, uh, let me let me double check tweet deck. Uh, let's see, no, oh, no, Phil Phil saying great job. Fantastic content. Loving the Python for DevOps series. Ah, thanks, guys. Cool. And gals. Um, 
No, uh, th thank you, thank you very much, uh, Chris. That that was a, that was a fantastic example, and and well, even even with the demo crashing, that's I mean that's that's part and parcel of live demos. That's what that's what happens. Two out of three. Yeah, yeah, it happened. <laughs> but you know what? The the thing is, is that's why we have commit history to show that it did work at one time. Exactly. Um, and and all of this uh, is publicly available, so um, you guys can check it out. I'm not really sure what happens if you if you guys run jobs against my my 50 minutes. I don't particularly care. Um, this is the first time that I, I've used this uh, for personal use. So uh, feel free to kick off those jobs if you have the right permissions. Um, if you want to play around with the code, it's there for the taking. Um, and that's it. So. Cool. Well, and we'll post the uh, we'll post the links in the um, on the the YouTube. Well, well actually, I'll, I'll I'll talk about you. I'll talk with you about that afterwards, if that's okay to do. I don't I don't want to have uh, crazy people out in the wild doing uh, nefarious things to to your uh, your times on there. <laughs> all right. Um, cool. Um, all right, Chris. I will see you at the uh, next AWS user group meeting. Thank you very much for for presenting for us tonight. And um, th thanks from everybody else. Everybody else is going yay. Huzzah, there's lots lots of kudos and and of course Graham is saying he'll know me in five minutes. Bah ha ha ha. Uh, <laughs> how much your AWS keys worth? Great, thanks. <laughs> They're worth nothing because he's already changed them. Uh, <laughs> awesome, cool. Awesome, thanks for having me. Th thank you everybody and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>